to stay and fight because that's the only place that we, we can um, expect you to fight for us. So there is an element, yes, of it being uh, one-sided. People said to us, you knew that when you offered yourself up uh, to be elected, and we knew that when we were voting for you on the last occasion. And so this is uh, a feature as uh, discomforting and as abhorrent as it gets sometimes, but it is a feature of our democracy which we have to continue fighting to change. But we, we cannot, by staying out, uh, abdicate our role and responsibility. I can tell you that uh, we did, uh, for, for quite a few months, stay out of Parliament um, when the issue of Minister Ramsamy came up. So, and we did announce after the Luzitnan and Bartika massacres that we would be going to Parliament on a selective basis. And so our, there are times when we, when we have walked out, there are times when we have not participated at all, and there are times when we have stayed out for a few months. So we have from time to time over the last four and a half years exercised that right to stay out. But to remove ourselves permanently would require a mandate uh, in the same way that we receive one to go, we would have to receive one to, to remove ourselves. And we haven't received the mandate of the majority of people who elected us to come out of Parliament. Dennis? Dennis, you want to add to that the Press Association of Guyana? <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. Because if I were to invite you to join us... Uh -huh. Well, it's one thing to, to, to categorize them as all weak, but I, I deal with you, for example, on a regular basis. I don't consider you to be weak. Uh, there are strong individuals in our society. I would, I would uh, concede that organizationally, uh, some of these civil society organizations are not as strong as they should be. And I will also be uh, brave enough to admit that not all of the political parties are as strong as they want to be themselves. But in the, in the vein of Article 13 of our Constitution, right. which speaks about Article. inclusivity, uh, it necessarily follows that we cannot uh, take on to ourselves the role of being the only persons who have a right in the decision-making of Guyana, and therefore we have a duty to reach out to civil society, and if they are weak, to, to add strengths um, and to fortify them, and I'm sure that there are weaknesses inherent in our political structures that they could also strengthen. So uh, we're looking to enter into partnerships and not to be uh, castigating and condemning people as weak and therefore ineffectual. We believe that we, have, uh, we both have something that we can offer each other. That is from the political domain and the civil society domain that, that can pr produce a more perfect um, union um, uh, and political force. You know, gentlemen, Dennis, and, and, and if you hold for a second, um, and if we want to move forward, uh, th there are a number of goals that, that has been placed here uh, by the AFC as part of their manifesto, so to speak, or objectives. And if we could go through them and you, and you could comment on them, and afterwards, Dennis, we could ask questions once we have um, completed a, a, a heading. Let's start with healing and reconciliation. Um, your comments on, on, well, on what, what is your vision? You know, a building or a structure has many uh, pillars, but I would say that the center pillar, the main beam of the AFC is healing and reconciliation. And Cameron and I got together in 2005. It was really to produce and to create a new political culture, a new order, one in which the races of Ghana were um, healed, or the divisions were healed and we were reconciled. We cast our minds back to the division, that the grand division or great division that was created in 1953 when uh, Jagan and Burnham separated themselves. And we believe that once in a lifetime comes such an opportunity. And so uh, many of Ghana's problems, as I've recently remarked, have to do with the suspicions, the distrust, the, the, the need for uh, revenge or stereotyping. And so if we can demonstrate that we can come from two different backgrounds, two different political parties, 
uh, two different cultures and we can find commonality and that commonality has to be Guyana's development in a cohesive and united way, then we'd be miles ahead of where we are now. Uh, Bobby, you've gone through the Caribbean, you've gone to many countries in the world, many of which have far less resources than we do, but which, which um, as I've said you know, all the time, exponentially are far ahead of us um, economically and socially, yet we continue to speak about Guyana's potential four to 50 years, almost now after independence and our modern uh, creation. So. Healing and reconciliation is very, very near and dear to the AFC, and it is, uh, as I said, our center pillar. You know, let us talk a bit about uh, the judiciary. You both are attorneys at law, and obvious, um, there might be cracks or concerns about the judiciary in Guyana. There has been calls in many sectors for a whole revamping of the judicial system. What are your thoughts on, on, on the judicial system, and to some extent, um, law and order in Guyana, because there has been allegations as well that there has been a tremendous breakdown in law and order. What are your thoughts? Definitely, the judiciary needs an overhaul, and uh, that is ongoing through, uh, I think, an IDB judicial sector reform process. It is being stalled, I think, by the bureaucracy. There are very many things that are not getting on that ought to be got on with. Um, the revision of our laws, the setting up of a law revision commission, the set up of a law constitutional law reform commission. Um, they haven't been happening. And I think it is because the government is playing down law and order, playing down the judiciary. That is why it is not getting the emphasis that it needs to get. I rather suppose it is because the government feel that it is okay, the present status of the judiciary. But indeed, this is such an important institution of government and governance um, that the Alliance for Change feels that it must fast track all those that the IDB judicial sector reform process um, had indicated ought to be implemented. Um, better training for our judges, more supplies of the legal text to them, resources to ensure that they can have um, modern quality of um, note-taking rather than a judge sitting down there as you speak from the witness box you got to do it in longhand writing no stenographers and so on all of these things make the judiciary very inefficient the other thing also is to enhance the accountability of judges judges sometimes even when they take longhand all the notes do not write their decisions eight nine sometimes two years after um, and that is not good at all. It is absolutely as a result probably of bad appointments to judgeships um, and magistracy and in the magistracy. We feel that we have to sharpen up on these things um, and even when you appoint judges, they go through some period of training, whether it's outside or bringing trainers into the country to ensure that that happens. But even in and around the public service, I feel that we have to also inculcate a culture of human rights and also the better um, systems within the police force to gain that law and order um, standard that we want for Guyana. Um, it is going to be difficult, but again, recruitment of policemen, not policemen that is going to throw kerosene in the privates and set a match to burn it, uh, things like that, but also human rights education in the police force we feel a better human rights education within administrators at the regional level, even in the upper echelons of all of the institutions, so that they can have this kind of culture seeping down to the lower rungs within these institutions that can create a better law and order. We feel there must be a stronger DPP's chambers, more prosecutors, uh, more experienced lawyers who can be made prosecutors. That is a function of, I think, salaries because the more equipped and better skilled lawyers do not want to be prosecutors because they don't have the salary structures that they can have in private practice. We have to look at that. That is an important aspect of it. But generally, the resources all across the country, rather than, as you know, not getting their priorities right by virtue of spending $600 million in computers and all the necessary things, we feel it ought to have been where computer labs would have been in schools and half that money could have gone for resourcing, let's say, your judiciary and your police force. Um, we feel that the priorities are not right in that country by this government. Dennis? Yes, uh, I wanted to take up both uh, the agenda and the matter of judicial reform and so on. I wanted to ask you something in Thank you. 
In relation to the repeal, you know I gave a major address to Parliament, Dennis, in that score. I would prefer the existing regime whereby the DPP can do a reference appeal and questions of law, not on where a jury has found an accused acquitted or not guilty. You then can still hold that accused and pending the outcome of the appeal, he can still be in prison. I think that is a tremendous um, uh, negative in our criminal law system. Once a jury has acquitted you, you are free. The DPP could go up on a question of law, the man will still be at home with his family, um, but in the scenario that they have created now, with this new regime, that person has to be in the lockups. And if that uh, appeal takes two or three years to come up, the poor fellow will be there. And then when he wins his appeal, what do you do? There is no compensation package that that fellow will get. So, indeed, I feel that what existed just prior to the implementation of this new appeal system to the Court of Appeal in relation to that, that we definitely will repeal. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis, with regards to your uh, pointed question to me, let's not count Mrs. Hola out. She's nowhere near out. She is, uh, in fact, on the mend and doing very well. But suffice to say, and I think everyone needs to know that I will do whatever is needed for the sake of the ASC and for Guyana. So, um, I'm always available, I'm still lead of the party, and I'm prepared to play any role that I'm called upon uh, to play. But Mrs. Holder is A-OK -okay and uh, will be resuming her, her duties in the not too distant future. You know, as we continue... We'll, we'll be, we will advise um, the, the public in due course. We'll, we're looking at all those things. All right, as we continue here, it is One Caribbean Radio 97.9 HD2. And of course, if you are logged on to the web, we are onecaribbeanradio.com. And we are listening and chatting with Mrs. Kemra Dramtaten and Raphael Trotman of the Alliance for Change in Guyana. Also on the panel today, down in Georgetown, Dennis Brawl from Demerara Waves. Gentlemen, a part of the goal set by the AFC in, in your outlook is talk about liberal democracy, good governance, uh, industrialization, and jobs. I, I packaged that together so that we could you know, keep it together and flowing, and so you'll be able to answer um, directly as to what are your concerns. Again, about democracy, liberal democracy, good governance, industrialization, and jobs. What are your thoughts on what direction um, the AFC is looking towards putting that into place? Well, look, in relation to job creation, that's a fundamental. So many graduates coming out from university and the vo vocational schools, or the high schools, not finding jobs. Eight, nine subjects, some of them 13 subjects, CXC, not finding jobs. We have to create jobs so that they can be growth. But the only way we think we can create jobs is that we have to make a, an entrepreneurial class, private sector development for the country. What we have heard the private sector say is that taxes are too high. At the rate of 35% uh, you, taxation levels, that is too high for manufacturing and service sector provisioning. Um, we also feel too that e, e, the, um, what is called infrastructural work that is required, uh, like setting up economic zones and uh, areas for uh, factories to be built and plants to, to, to be set up, they're not in Guyana. Uh, we think that if we can utilize some of the revenues for the creation of that kind of infrastructure and curb what is called this humongous corruption we have in Guyana. Corruption which, as our experts have